So uh, <clears throat> I'm just picking up where I uh, where I left off last week. Uh, so I think most of you look familiar from last week. So I don't have too much to to review, and I think this will be the the shorter part of the talk. Um, but let's just remember the story so far. Uh, we have these modern processors that have these long instruction pipelines, and uh, they have to, for performance reasons, whenever they branch, they have to make a guess about which way that branch is going to go, uh, whether it's going to be, uh, the jump will be taken or whether it won't be taken. Um, and when they make a misprediction, so when they get that wrong, then uh, that costs a lot, about 20 to 25 cycles. And these things are trying to execute about an instruction every cycle. Um, some code gets more than one instruction per cycle, but that's fairly rare. The typical business code can, can get close to an instruction per, per cycle. Um, so one of the tricks is to avoid branches using conditional moves. Uh, and more generally, not so much on Intel processors, but on, uh, on things like ARM processors, the uh, sometimes the entire instruction set has these conditional versions, like that basically are of the form, only execute this instruction if some condition is true. Um, conditional move is just a special case where you take a value and move it into a register, but only if some, some condition is true. Um, so that's one side of it, what's happening on the processor. And then there's the memory side, where there's hierarchy of, uh, of uh, smaller, memory close to the processor, which is much, much faster, uh, and then memory that gets further and further away uh, from the processor, which is, uh, is much, much slower. Um, L1, L2, and L3 cache are actually right on the same chip as the processor. RAM is a separate physical chip. Uh, disk is, well, you know, even further still, and, uh, and then some stuff might even be over the network. Um, and remember that the memory subsystem is, uh, is aggressive. Uh, it tries to hide the fact that it takes a long time to get these things from far away in memory. So it tries to, to prefetch them and bring them in closer parts of memory before you, before you need them. Uh, we can do that ourselves. There's this built-in prefetch that's part of GTC, and other C compilers have, uh, have similar instructions that uh, basically hint to the processor to go get something because I think I'm, I'm going to need it. Um, and we saw that uh, there's also this kind of implicit prefetching that happens. When you have branchy code, uh, the pipeline guesses uh, which way the branch is going to go. Uh, whichever guess it makes, there's somewhere in there, there's probably some memory accesses. And, uh, and those get prefetched as, as soon as, uh, as, basically, as soon as there's enough information in the pipeline to know what that, that memory access is, uh, is referring to. Um, and then weird things happen when you mix those, those two things. Uh, so we saw that binary search is basically uh, is optimal. It does the fewest number of comparisons. If we use branch free version of binary search, we get no branch mispredictions at all. So so we do the fewest number of comparisons, and we avoid any of these pipeline uh, flushes. Um, and you can uh, you can use prefetching as well with this branch-free version to get what was our fastest implementation of uh, of binary search. So that's branch-free code that, when it's looking at the middle element in the search range, actually before it even looks at that element, it fetches the elements at position. Uh, one quarter way into the search range and three quarters of the way because it's going to need one of those two things next. Um, and it looks at the middle element and it decides to go to the one quarter or three quarter, which is there sooner than it would be uh, otherwise. Um, but I s I'll say its interaction with the cache hierarchy is non optimal, and that's because of another property of, these, uh, of this memory subsystem that I haven't talked about yet, and, uh, and that's the cache line size or the cache line width. So RAM is organized into uh, what are called lines, cache lines, or, or just lines. They're 64 bytes wide. So RAM is chunked up into these 64-byte 
quantities. Um, and so you can store different amounts of, uh, of data in there depending on how big your data is. So, you know, 16 pieces of, uh, of four byte data or eight pieces of, uh, of eight byte data um, or even just four pieces of, of, uh, of 16 byte data. Um, and when you uh, ask a single word in RAM, so let's say I say, here's RAM and my my code says access, you know, this byte or this integer in RAM, actually what happens is there's this whole 64 byte cache line that gets slurped up into the cache hierarchy. So, and it gets slurped up almost all at once. Um, and th there's a little bit of lag between the time the first bit of it and the last bit of it comes, but it's nothing compared to the, the, the total, uh, total delay. So, um, whether you access a single item or whether you access a bunch of items in this cache line, it, it sort of costs about the same. The, the expensive part is going all the way to RAM and fetching it into the, the cache. Um, so if you think about what that means for binary search, what does binary search do? Uh, it has this giant array, and the first thing it does is it looks in the middle of the array. So it takes that one element in the middle of the array, inspects it, and uh, that loads a whole cache line that contains that element. Now, if you think about this, uh, well, what happens next is it's either going to go left or right, and it's actually uh, very unlikely that it's going to come back and look at anything else in this cache line at this point. Right? It's going to go very far away. Uh, if this is a really big array going one quarter of the way or three quarters of the way, that's very far away from this midpoint. And so, uh, so it goes and looks at another place where there's another cache line that gets worked. And, you know, then it either will decide that it's going to go to the left or right of this range, uh, which is, again, still very far away at that point, loads in their cache line. And this goes on for a while until you get down finally near the bottom levels. Binary search has reduced the search range down into something small, something that fits into 64 bytes or so. And then the last few steps uh, are all in the same cache line. But up before that, pretty much every single access was into a, a different cache line. So if you say that uh, the number of items you can store in a cache line is B, um, so think, we'll stick with B equals 16 here, um, then what is binary search? How many cache lines does it actually use when it does a search? Well, it looks log n items. And it's only during the last few steps that it actually gets stuck in one cache line. And that's actually once it gets the problem down to something of size b, then it's in a single cache line. So that's log n minus log b cache lines that you, you look at. So for example, if you have a billion elements, 2 to the 30, uh, roughly a billion, and b is equal to 16, then, uh, then you're talking about looking at 26 different cache lines. Um, and that's not the best you can do. So it expects 30 values, which is the best it can do, but they're in 26 different cache lines. That's not, not great. Um, unfortunately, if we want to do better than this, then we need to store our data in a different way. Maybe not unfortunate, but it's just a fact of, of life. Um, we need a, a different layout, sorted order, is not the best way to do this anymore. So we all learned about binary search working on sorted arrays, but actually we want an array that is ordered in a very specific way, but it's not just that increasing from the smallest to the, the largest. Um, this is an old problem that has been known for a, a long time. Uh, in fact, it's uh, the data structure that solves this is older than I am by a year. Um, and the idea is something called, uh, in short, they're called B trees. Nobody knows what the word B is, what the letter B stands for. It's the source of uh, a lot of conjecture. Um, but basically, you think of it as a search tree in which every node has B plus one children and stores B keys. 
So here's an example of one of those things. Um, so at the root here, we have two keys, 9 and 13, and we have three children. And those children correspond to all the data we have that is smaller than 9, go off in the leftmost subtree. The data that's between 9 and 13 goes in the middle subtree, and the data that's bigger than 13 goes in the, uh, the right subtree. And uh, it's hard to draw, you know, real good examples of these, but think of B being 16 here. So the, the amount of data we can fit in a cache line. So it would be a tree where there's 16 things at the root, uh, 17 children correspond to all the little spaces between those things in, in sorted order, uh, and that's the, the tree that you get. Um, but we don't want to store this thing as a, as a tree. We want to have something that's, you know, comparable to searching a sorted array. So what we do is we take all of these, these nodes, these keys, and we pack them into an array in a fairly obvious way. Um, we just take them starting at the root. The first, the, the keys from the root go at the beginning of the array. Then we move to the next level, left, right. Uh, packing the, the keys in that we see. So we get 9 and 13, we get 3 and 6, 11 and 12, 14 15, and then these leaves the, the, the next level here. And then we fill the array, uh, and you know, we get sometimes, a, it doesn't always work out nicely, you sometimes get a, a partial, uh, partial leaf, and, uh, and of course a partial level at the bottom. In fact, it hardly ever works out nicely, because if you think of this thing as, uh, you know, B is 16, that means that each level has uh, 17 times more leaves than the, the previous level. Um, and so it would work out nicely if, if the number you're looking at is a power of uh, 17 minus 1 or something. So it's, it's pretty rare. Usually the bottom level is not very full. Cool. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you take the, the the way you design this this B tree is you just uh, you have some number n of items you want to store, and you say, can I store them all in the root? No. Then make another level. Can I store them all in the root plus that next level? No. Make another level and uh, and fill in. You know, eventually that last level is not going to completely full in general. So just fill it in left to right. Um, so it's, it's very, very highly structured. And actually, once you do this, um, something nice happens, which is we're imagining we have this tree, but really what we have is this array that's in this specific tree. But there's some fairly easy calculations you can do that involve uh, easy things like multiplying by 17 and then adding some, some offset that basically say, if I'm at this node, which starts at position i, and I want to go to the uh, middle child, then I just have to multiply by 3 and add, uh, add 1 or something. And there's an easy calculation for, for that um, to get from the node that starts at a specific index, and, uh, and so the start position and the child of that node is uh, an easy thing to, to do. Um, and now when we do a search, <coughs> well, we pretend or we imagine that we're searching in this tree, but we're searching in this array. Uh, the search in the tree starts at the root, and uh, it has to decide whether it needs to go to the left, the middle, or the, the right, uh, which means it starts here at the beginning of this array and, and makes that choice. And, uh, and then, once it decides, for instance, here, that it wants to go to the left child, it does that calculation that I just mentioned to say, okay, the next thing I want to look at is this block of nodes here, which corresponds to the, the middle child. And, uh, and then finally, uh, it decides here it wants to go left again, uh, takes us to this node. And even at this node, it decides it wants to go to the middle child, which brings us out of the array, which means the, the search is done. <coughs> uh, here we were looking for 10.5. Uh, and what's the answer? What's that? 
it's not in there, and if we want to tell us, if you want it to tell us what is uh, something close to 10.5, so this, the convention we were using is you should tell me the smallest thing which is bigger or equal to what you're searching for. So what is it in this case? It's 11. And that's basically uh, the way you, you get 11 is it's the last place on this uh, search path that we didn't take uh, a rightmost child. So the answer is not 10 because we kind of went to the, the right of 10 here. Uh, the answer is not this thing because there is actually no data there. So in this case, we turned left at 11, and, uh, and so that, that's the answer. Um, if we had gone down the middle here, the answer would be 12. So, uh, and if we had gone down the, the right here, the answer would be 13. <coughs> okay. Um, so what does that look like in this, this picture that I showed you? How does that compare to binary search? Uh, so, well, we said we start at the, the root of the B tree. So let me just go back here. Um, so remember, this in general is a pretty big thing here. This is like 16 uh, elements, not just the, the two that I've shown here. Uh, and it's packed at the, the front. So we start at root, and what do we do there? So we want to know, we're looking for this, which child we should go to next. So how would we figure that out? Did we look at all of the values in there? Well, in this case, there's, you know, in, for B equals 16, there's 17 children. Notice in this picture, they're stored in uh, order. So what do we, what should we do? We basically have a little array here of size 16 stored in sorted order. And we want to know where our element that we're searching for fits into that array. Well, that's what binary search does. That's what we've been studying. So we do a little micro binary search here on these 16 values. Um, so that takes uh, four or five steps for 16 values, and then that search finishes and says, okay, next thing you got to do is take the, whatever, the fourth child, this node, the address calculation, that takes you over here, which is in another cache line, um, which we did a little microbinary search on. So, and then finally this thing bounces us out of the, we, we bounce out the, the end of this, this array. So, a um, couple of questions are, how many cache lines does this thing look at? Well, basically, we're, we're searching in this pretend tree that we don't actually have. And each node fits in a cache line. We, we choose the size of the node so that it fits perfectly into a, a cache line. And so, really, it's just how many nodes we get in this tree which is uh, it's what we call the height of the tree. So we start at the root and we walk down. How, how many steps do we have to take? And, you know, if it were a binary tree, the height would be log base 2 of n. It's not a binary tree. It's a tree, a b plus 1 array tree. So the height is actually log base b plus 1 of n. A little more careful. It's actually the ceiling of that thing. Right? can't have a... A fractional height. Uh, it's got to be an integer, and it ends up being the, the ceiling. And, uh, and so that's log n, the log base, normal log base 2 of n, divided by log base b plus 1. Okay. Um, and the, the next question is, so we know how many cache lines it, it looks at. Uh, next question is, well, how many comparisons does it do? Well, inside each cache line, it does a little binary search. So it does log b2 of b plus 1 comparisons, uh, which is nice because if you look at, this is the number of cache lines. This is how many comparisons we do in each one. If you multiply those two things together, forgetting about these ceilings here, the answer is exactly log n. So it does exactly the same number of comparisons as, uh, as a binary search. Um, 
so it, it's optimal in terms of number of comparisons, but it seems to be accessing fewer, fewer cache lines. Okay. Uh, but there are these ceilings here. Let's not forget those. <coughs> so, for example, if n is 2 to the 30, that's what we looked at before, uh, about a billion elements, and b is 16, then uh, just do this calculation. You'll see that you only access eight cache lines in a search. Remember, binary search, we have to look at 26 different cache lines here. And these things sort of do the same number of comparisons if, you, if you're rough about it and, uh, and don't worry about these, these ceilings. Okay, any questions? No? Good. All right, how does it perform? Well, here's our fastest implementation of binary search in orange. And here is the fastest, like, really working hard implementation of B trees that we could come up with using exactly the right value of B. In this case, the, the right value is 16. And indeed, it's faster. Uh, kind of. Until you look a little more closely and you zoom in at this thing, uh, it's like faster and here once you get up to a billion elements which we kind of did a calculation that predicted that but this doesn't look so great here b trees aren't doing so well for these these small values um, in fact when you zoom in you really see this is pretty far off right the the baseline here just basically what it costs forgetting about the searching but just what it costs to run the test is somewhere around this line right here. Um, and so, you know, there's a huge jump. This is like, well, around this point, it's, uh, it's like 100 times slower or something. I mean, really, really terrible. Um, so anything weird about this? Notice anything weird about the purple plot? It's kind of jaggy, sort of steppy. Um, so where does the first step happen? Two to the four. Two to the four is 16. So that's the place where you go from storing everything at root to needing a second level. And so that's the time when you go from one little binary search on something of size 16 to two little binary searches on things of size uh, 16. Um, that's a big step, right? And that so it doesn't matter, it almost doesn't matter whether you have only a little bit more than 16 or whether you have a lot more than 16, so 16 times 16, whatever that is, sort of costs about the, the same after a while, um, until you reach the next point where, uh, where you need to go up to another level and then you get this jump again. Okay. Um, so there's this big step that, that happens, and that's that ceiling in that formula that I showed you. Basically, you take the number of levels and you multiply by the log of the of the of b, um, and this is this is what happens. Um, the number of levels is an integer, so it increases in integer steps, and log of b is a fixed thing, so you you get these these steps here. It's really not not good. Um, one thing is our very optimized binary search also has the same steppy formula, but the steps are uh, at nice little powers of, uh, of two, basically. Um, that was part of the, the optimization process. Is it should run basically for the, the same number of steps, no matter what you're searching for. Um, okay, so why are B trees so slow, at least on, on small sizes? Uh, well, like I said, uh, that internal binary search has B plus one possible outcomes. And it's just a of life that cache sizes, this is something hardware designers like, they like powers of two. So that B is typically a power of two, which means that B plus one is just one more than a power of two. So if we really wanted to uh, search the best way possible, when we're searching a node, there's B plus one possible children we would like to get to. We would like to be able to do that using 4.08 comparisons. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to do that. We have to use five comparisons. That's 
quite a bit more. It's about the worst thing that could happen, right? If, if, if b plus 1 was a power of 2, we'd do exactly four comparisons, but we have just a little bit more, and that costs us a, an extra one. So that's like, I don't know what you call that, 25% more or 20% more, uh, depending on, on how you look at it. That's not good. Um, and then each time you add a new level, I explained you get this, uh, this big jump in search time because you pay another one of these five comparisons. So the search cost goes up five, five units at a time. Um, so, you know, look, look at a smaller example. If n is 2 to the 10 and b equals 16, well, then log base b plus 1 of n is 2.44. But you take the ceiling, you get three levels. Uh, and remember, we have to do five comparisons at every node, so that's 15 comparisons. Uh, binary search uh, only needs 10 because it's searching on something of size 2 to the 10. So uh, it's doing, you know, 50% more comparison than, than binary search. So that's one of the problems. That explains all of these steps in here, but it doesn't explain the whole difference. Um, other issues are the B tree code is kind of big. Uh, it's long, it's complicated, it does things like multiply by 17. Uh, to get it actually even this fast, we had to use tricks like unraveling the inner search um, so that it's not a, actually a loop, or a while loop searching on a node, it's actually just a hard-coded section of, uh, of straight, straight code. But even with all those tricks, um, you, you have problems, uh, it, it's not any faster, and it requires an extra piece of bookkeeping, which is, remember, one of the points of binary search is that it can tell you not just whether the thing is there or not, but it can also tell you where the next biggest thing is. And that means we have to do some extra bookkeeping. Um, in particular, as we're doing this search, we're keeping an extra variable that's telling us, uh, oh, where's the last time we made a a not rightmost turn. So we're here it would say uh, at this point the answer was 13 before we go down let's save that because that might be the final answer. At this point let's update that answer to 11. At this point we don't update that answer and in the end we, we return. So there's this is extra bookkeeping here. Which you know doesn't sound like much but remember the code for binary search was like tiny, tiny, super short um, and you, you know everything you put inside that while loop costs you. Okay, so, uh, you know, binary search is optimal, we've said it before, but now there's quotes around optimal because we've seen things that are optimal in different ways. Um, optimal here means it does the smallest number of comparisons. And in fact, it makes no branch mispredictions if you implement it right. Uh, but it's not cache friendly. B trees, well, they're also optimal in some sense. Optimal means uh, they actually access the smallest number of cache lines that could be uh, accessed by any of these things. So that's the, the best you can do if all you're counting is, is cache lines. Um, but they do more comparisons than necessary, so they're not optimal in the same sense as binary search. And, uh, and they're kind of complicated, which means they're not uh, optimal in terms of, you know, how long it actually takes them to execute. That's uh, in the end, that's, that's the measure you care, right? I mean, you don't care about these other weird definitions of optimality. What you care about is how long does this thing take to, to run? So what next? Um, so we saw something very simple, binary search. And now something uh, more complicated, B trees. So what next is actually something in between? Um, so, things we know. Branch mispredictions are expensive. Let's avoid those. Uh, memory chunked into 64-byte cache lines. Let's make use of that. The memory subsystem can prefetch at the same time we compute things. That's what our fast implementation of binary search used. B trees take advantage of these first two things. At least if we implement them well, we can avoid branch mispredictions. Um, and the... Uh, the, the the whole point of B trees is that they access the memory 64 bytes at a time, uh, B units at a, at a time. But they don't make use of this third property. Basically, B trees do a search 
search inside a node. Once they know the result of that search, they know which node they want to get to next. That's the next cache line. So they compute for a while and then say, now give me the next chunk of memory. So they stop at that point and wait for that memory to, to come back. Then they do another binary search once it's there, stop, wait for that to come back. So they're not taking advantage of this possible parallelism between memory and, and processing. Uh, and then they have their own other problems. One of them comes from the fact that if B is a power 2, which is what you need to pack things nicely into a cache line, then B plus 1 definitely isn't, which is what you need to do binary search quickly. Um, and there's this extra bookkeeping uh, that you have to do during the search so that you remember what the answer is in case you didn't find exactly the, the value you're looking for. So, um, B trees went back to 1972. Uh, Next thing is to go back about 500 years uh, to the 1500s to this, uh, this guy called Eisinger, who was uh, doing a lot of data structures work in the 1500s. Uh, no, he, he wasn't actually. He was, uh, he was doing one of the stupidest jobs imaginable, uh, writing down the family trees of royal families. Um, so, you know, you, you have this person this uh, uh, you know, this noble person, and the people cared about their bloodline. So you know, this person has two parents, a mother and father, and uh, and so that sort of like the, the binary split. And those two people had each had two parents, a mother and a father, mother and a father. Uh, hopefully, all four of those were different, but not necessarily back then, uh, especially with nobility. And then, you know, this went back many generations. And of course, you know, if you go back K generations, then you have two to the K ancestors at that level. And he was making books of this stuff. Um, well, one thing about books is it's hard to draw a big binary tree on the page of a book. So he came up with a numbering system that let him write this down as a list, uh, as well as a, a computation so that you could say, oh, if I'm looking at this person in the list, uh, who are their two parents? What, what positions are, are they at? Um, and, uh, and so that, that's all this goes, goes back to him. Uh, so you take a full binary tree like this. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a, a binary search tree. So, and then you write down, uh, just reverse it left to right, writing down the values that you see in the, the nodes. Um, so putting those into an array, so this goes at position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Um, and now something really easy happens, which is uh, if I want to see what are the children of, uh, of the node, which core, which is stored at position i in the array, they're just at positions 2i and 2i plus 1. So what are the children of 5, 11, and 12, or sorry, 2i plus 1 and 2i plus 2? 11 and 12. Okay. Um, now this is actually nothing special. This is just B trees, but B equals 1. Okay. So uh, each node stores one piece of data that like a B tree does for B equals 1. And it has B plus 1 children, um, 2 children. Now funny fact is that uh, 1 and Two are both powers of two. That's the only time you can take a power of two and add one and get another power of two, which is a bit silly, but actually is is really important here. Okay, <coughs> um, search looks like this. You pretend you're searching in the and you comparison against the the value that you look at. That tells you whether you need to go to the left child or the right child. Compute the left or right child, you compute either 2i plus 1 or 2i plus 2. Um, one thing you probably know is computing 2 times i is not a real multiplication. It's actually just a shift, which is faster than real multiplication. Um, so you get a simpler computation. In, in particular, it's easier to compute 2 times i than 17 times i. <coughs> um, and so you know, that gives you this, this path in the tree that we took here, gives you this, this path in the, uh, the array. 
So we look at 8. Uh, the thing we're looking for, 11.5, is bigger than 8. So we go to the right child, which is 2 times 0 plus 2. Um, 11.5 is smaller than 12. We go to the left child, which is 2 times 2 plus 1, 5, and, and so on. So really easy calculation. And now here's something uh, else, something a little bit funny here. Uh, get numbers on these nodes. <clears throat> and imagine we add 1 to them all. So we, eat, we, we instead of pretending that our, saying that our race starts at index 0, imagine it starts at index 1. Then <clears throat> the root here uh, has index 1. This guy has index 2, this guy has index 4, and this guy has index 8. So all nice powers of 2. Um, so 8, for instance, in binary, that looks like a 1 followed by three zeros. So uh, a 1 and three zeros. And this guy here, let's say, has index 9, which looks like a 1 followed by two zeros and a 1. So is that related in any way to this, this tree? Well, it turns out that it is. Um, so if you forget that leading 1, drop that, that leading 1. So 8 is 1 and 3 zeros. And a way to think of that is uh, to get to this Thing which is labeled virtually labeled 8 here. Uh, 0 tells you to turn left, 0 tells you to turn left, and 0 tells you to turn left. To get to this thing which is labeled 9, remember 9 was a 1, two zeros, and a 1. We drop leading 1. 0, so we get 0, 0, 1. 0 tells you turn left, 0 tells you turn left, 1 tells you turn right. And actually, you'll convince yourself quickly that that's true for, for all of these nodes. So the, you take the index of something in this array and add 1, and that actually somehow encodes the path to that thing. Okay. So here's just a, a, an example. Um, here we searched for 11.5. We walked down this tree, and in fact we jumped out of the tree, or if you like it, we walked down this array and jumped out of the array. Um, the search told us, uh, basically the search ended because we were at index 12 uh, in the array. The search said, go right, so that gave us index uh, 2 times 12 is 24, 2 is 26, uh, but that's outside the array. So we, that's how we know we're, we're done. Um, but now we can use that, that answer 26. So we add 1, because that seems to, to help us recover these things. And we get, uh, we get 27, which is 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We'll drop that leading 1. And I'll check the, the path that we get. That's 1, 0, 1. Okay. Nice. Uh, so somehow... The, the final result of this thing, the final index that you get to, tells you how you got there. Now, <clears throat> when we're searching for 11.5, um, what is the, uh, the actual answer that we should be returning? 12. Why 12? We turn left. In fact, 12 is the, the last place we turn left. So a search is always bouncing back and forth, going left or right, left or right. Um, it's always narrowing down the interval that contains the thing that you're searching for. When you go left, it's narrowing down the top part. When you go right, it's narrowing down the, the bottom part. Um, and so if you want the smallest thing, which is bigger than the thing you're searching for, it's the last place you turn left. Well. That corresponds to the uh, last zero in this, uh, this string here. And, uh, and, okay, that seems good. 
so these last few right turns don't matter to us. So we wiped out, um, and we're left with 1, 1, 0. Now this isn't an array index. This is an array index plus 1. So we take the 1 off, and we're left with 1, 0. That's what? 1, 0 in binary is 2. And what's that index 2 in the array? The answer, 12. So a little bit of magic happens that <clears throat> we do this search. We don't do any special bookkeeping. We have this, this integer i that's telling us what we're looking at. But by the end of this process, from i, we can decode uh, the answer to the, the, the place, the location in the array that stores the, the value we want. So, what does that all look like? Um, oh, and this, this one of the tricky things, or not tricky, but, um, you know, I said the answer is basically determined by the last zero in this string. Well, operations, in, in this, uh, the last zero in this, uh, this integer, operations like find the last zero in a, in a binary number or find the, the first one or m many of these things, uh, processors have instructions, specific hardware instructions for, for those things. And again, if you look at the documentation for your C compiler, you'll find that, uh, that you, can, you can access those instructions through special built-ins. Um, so here's the whole code for searching in this, uh, this item or layout. You start at i equals zero. We know that's where the, the root is. We compare x to a at i. Uh, if it's less than or equal to a at i, we go to 2i plus 1, otherwise we go to 2i plus 2. That's the entire inner loop of this code. It executes log n times. Once it's done, we just do a little bit of extra work to decode this, uh, this thing at the end. So this is just doing, this is just finding that last, uh, that last zero in, uh, in that, that binary number. Pretty slick, right? And this kind of code here, uh, when it's something this simple, it's basically i is being updated with one of two possible choices, um, and that's the only thing inside the loop. The compiler can't resist using a conditional move to do this. So actually what happens is the register allocated for i, um, it gets this value stored in it, and conditionally uh, maybe this value overwrites it. Code looks like that. There's the whole while loop uh, right there. So down here, jump to the back of the top of the wall, jump to the, the top of the while loop, one conditional move in, inside of that. Okay. Super, uh, super slick. This is a little bit longer, this code, uh, but this only executes once and it executes log n times. So it's, it's really what's inside the while loop that. Uh, that matters. Okay, uh, so that means that the bookkeeping that B-trees do is unnecessary. We don't have to keep track of the last place we turned left. It's somehow kept track of automatically. Um, but, I mean, this, look at one of the searches, it's still bouncing all over the place in this array, and it's taking big uh, leaps that are getting bigger and bigger. So actually, uh, if you just think about this for a few minutes, um, you'll see that at the beginning, you'll do about log of B steps all in one cache line, but then after that, you start jumping steps that are bigger than B, so you're just jumping to a new cache line every time. That's not a good use of, uh, of cache lines, or it's not a small number of, of cache lines. Um, so somehow it's not as good as B-trees for, for that, or so it seems. But let's look at this a little more closely. It turns out that maybe the answer is not the number of cache lines that you, uh, you access. Maybe that's not important. But how far in advance you can prefetch them. How far in advance you can predict the cache line that you're, you're going to access. So imagine you are navigating in this 
virtual Eitzinger tree. You're really just doing calculations in an array, but imagine you're looking at this tree. Um, here you are at position i. About to, you've done some search, and now you've found yourself at position i. Uh, well, if you look at i's left child, it's at position 2i plus 1. And now if you apply the formula to that, uh, so you multiply by 2 and add 1, that tells you that guy's left child. And you multiply by 2 and add 1, that tells you that guy's left child. And you multiply by 2 and add 1, tells you this guy. Um, the great-grandchild, no, the great-great-grandchild of i, the leftmost one, is at position 16i plus 15. Okay? Um, so remember these cache lines, we're using this example that they can hold 16 items. So this position here is not exactly a multiple of... Uh, of 16, uh, but this one is. This is 16i plus 16. So that's actually a multiple of 16. So these, all these 15 great great grandchildren of i are stored in a single cache line. Okay. Um, and if you just before you start, if you just align your array, set offset your array by one, well then you get all of them are stored in a cache line. Not just 15 out of 16, but all of them. Okay? So, what does this mean? <clears throat> this means that if I'm at position i right now, I'm at node i, I'm about to do my comparison that tells me whether to go left or right in the tree, I already know four levels in advance uh, which cache line I'm going to need. So before I do that, I can ask the memory subsystem to prefetch this cache line, and it will definitely contain the thing that I need four steps from now. Okay. So that's what the code ends up looking like. Um, you just it's the same code as before, but you put in a, a prefetch here, and the multiplier and offset are calculated depending on the, the value of b. Um, but this is 16, and this is, uh, is I think, 15. Um, or, I don't know, maybe 24 or something. It doesn't matter. Um, you, can, you can calculate this thing. But the, the point is, um, that means that the, the data that I need will be available, actually, uh, before I need it, I will have to do a comparison at this level. One, two, three, four. I have time to do four comparisons before I actually need this, this data. And remember that the memory subsystem can go ahead and do stuff, start fetching this stuff, and do it at the same time as I'm doing those comparisons. How well does this work? Well, here it is. Uh, it's the green line here. Um, so this is this branch-free Eitzinger with prefetching. Um, purple line, remember, is B trees, which is terrible in this range and a little bit faster in, in the, the larger range. Uh, and the orange line was somehow the best binary search we could, we could come up with. And uh, yeah, so compared to binary search, we've you know, about cut it in half at the, the, the high end of the scale. Uh, we're still way faster even than B trees at the high end of the scale. Um, here, uh, we start killing binary search already when we leave the, uh, the L2 cache. And down here, not quite as good as the binary search, but pretty good. Um, pretty close. Okay. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I like because this is, what was it? six lines of code that dominates the 35 lines of B-tree code that we need to get this purple line. Um, it's not really much more complicated than we need to get this orange line and kills it in the, the high end and keeps up with it at the, the low end. So if I had to pick one strategy to implement um, that was independent of the size of the array, it would be this, uh, this thing here. Okay. Any questions?
Yep. How much like, long does it take to construct these things prior to the, uh, like, I know sorting is end log end here. Yeah, so if you give me a sorted array, then it's easy to do a B tree layout or a um, or a uh, Eitzinger layout in linear time. So you're not resorting; you're just moving the data around. The the Eitzinger layout you can even do, uh, and this is actually uh, a project that I'm uh, I'm working on. You can even do it without an extra array. So I take the data in your sorted array, do a bunch of stuff, and now it's ordered in the Eitzinger layout the, the right way. Um, so it's, that's called in place. Uh, so you know, if you have an application that's heavy on, on searching in a sorted array, uh, you know, that does a lot of this batch searching sorted array, you can call sort, say, OK, take that thing and, and turn it into this Eitzinger layout, do all your searches, and even if you want it back in sorted order again, you can undo that. And it's, that's, that's very quick compared to the, the time that it will take to do a, a lot of searches. So for instance, um, doing this on an array of like uh, 500 million elements, con the conversion is faster than 2 million searches in that array. So, so it's, uh, it's worth doing even if the number of searches is quite a bit smaller. Uh, yeah, so there it is at the small scale. It's not quite exactly as fast as, uh, as this, uh, <coughs> this binary search, but it, uh, it comes close. Um, notice anything weird there? These little humps. Any idea what's happening there? That's really not obvious. So where are the, where are the humps the smallest? Powers of two. Um, did I bring them? Yes. So why would they be small at powers of two? What is the uh, what are the things that cost us extra time? What were the problems? Cache misses, and what else? What's the thing causes thing we tried to avoid early on? Branch mispredictions. So when a uh, n is a power of 2, in fact, when n is power of 2 minus 1, then you get a perfect tree like this. Right? So when you take a binary tree and you build it on so that it has 2 to the k minus 1 nodes, you get a perfect binary tree where every level is full. When n is not a power of 2, more generally, you get a tree like this. The bottom level is only partially full. Okay? Now remember, the search code, the search for this thing, is, uh, is inside a, uh, a while loop. And a while loop is, of course, the bottom of a while loop is a branch that says, go back to the top of the loop or quit the loop. So when your tree looks like this, every time you execute the while loop, you take exactly the same number of steps. The processor very quickly learns that about that while loop, and it knows that, uh, you know, let's say that this, this number of steps here is 10. It knows that this branch that takes you back to the top of the while loop will execute 10 times and then not be executed on the 11th time. And it predicts perfectly in that case. It actually does the 10 predictions to the top, and the 11th one it will skip. However, when your tree looks like this, sometimes your searches go here for 11 steps, and sometimes your searches go here for only 10 steps, and the processor has to make a guess about that last step, whether it's going to go to the top or not. It doesn't really know what the, the tree looks like. Um, so it makes this, this branch misprediction. And of course, the, the closer you are to a power of 2, the, the better that prediction is. So this thing here is basically the cost, this gap here is the cost of one branch misprediction, just at the end of the, the loop. Um, so even one matters. 
Okay, um, so just a, just a you know, quick picture of what's happening, which is a little bit shocking. This is what a B tree does uh, for B equals 16. Five comparisons and then off to memory. Five comparisons and then off to memory. Five comparisons and then off to memory. This is what branch free icing is doing. One comparison, send a request to memory. One comparison, send a request to memory. One comparison, send a request to memory. Memory is doing, in general, it's handling four requests at a time. There's, memory's got its own pipeline that handles these requests, you know, one after the other. Um, and they, can, you know, they, they're, they take the same amount of time as they do for the B tree, except that you're doing something else useful in the meantime. Um, so really what's happening here is Eitzinger is terrible in terms of the number of cache lines that it hits, which is something that people were obsessed about for a, for a while. That's why they, they like bee trees that want to reduce the number of cache misses. But it turns out that that's not important. Cache misses aren't the actual critical thing. Um, it's, it's even better than reducing cache misses is to just be able to, to predict in advance what uh, you'll need from the, the cache. Um, you use more bandwidth that way, much more data is going back and forth between memory and, uh, and processor, but it's still faster by, by not a small margin. Um, yeah, so the conclusion is, uh, you know, if you really care about performance, if you're working in one of these fields, uh, computer games or uh, large-scale numerical analysis, you have to know all this stuff. And even if you know about all this stuff, uh, you have to implement things and see, see how they work. Uh, the, the, the ideas that you have about performance uh, are not necessarily accurate. There can be all kinds of things that interact in strange ways that make it, uh, make it impossible for you to, to really predict what's going to happen until you test. And then even when you test, you may get weird results uh, that take you know, a fair bit of time to, uh, to explain. Um, and that's only if you're doing stupid things like binary search. I mean, just working on something that's processor and memory intensive. Um, you know, if you're working with graphics, there's this whole complicated graphics car on your system that can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things. Um, if you're doing disk and file I.O., you have to deal with those. And now there's hard disks and there's solid state drives that uh, have different characteristics. Uh, and if you work with networks, well, that's, that's a whole other uh, ballpark. So the, there's the whole world out there. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where I'll stop uh, for good now. You don't have to come back again. Any last questions for Pat? I just have a question about how that nexus would deal with this um, big array of sorted integers. That means that you can't really Yep. Yeah. So they, they basically um, they you know they basically do batch processing. So uh, you know once every thirty minutes or so they'll update this array, or once every fifteen minutes they'll update this array. Um, but it's continuously being searched, and that is way way more uh, efficient than you know using something like a uh, a red black tree or something, where pretty much in that case, uh, every step is guaranteed to be a, almost guaranteed to be a cache. Every step of a search is almost guaranteed to be a, a cache miss. Yes, you can do the updates a little bit faster, but uh, but it, it's not it doesn't doesn't pay off. Yeah. Um, so these sorted or ordered arrays are good for batch processing. Yeah, you can't update them, but uh, but there's a lot of applications would like you know, important large scale applications where batch processing is a, is a big part of it. Yep. A good compiler will know that's just shift. Yeah, you don't need to. You don't need to do that yourself in your your code. So yeah, thanks, Pat, for coming and uh, giving us.
I talk, I was, I learned a lot. <laughs> no problem, you're, you're welcome. Uh, I'm still going to have to some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of information. So, yeah. Uh,